studies in geological sciences from uh, Brown University in Providence. Uh, as I said, she has had a long career. She is a prolific writer. She has written many publications about science, technology, uh, economics, investment. So we'll be delighted to welcome Dr. Stockham. Thank you. So while well, we're trying to um, get my presentation up, so I'm afraid I'm going to make you listen to a lot of science um, talking about what is it that we're sort of focusing on at NASA. And that's a hard thing to do in a sense because there's so much out there, and, and I'll touch on that briefly. But everything we do now at NASA, and this is going to be a recurring theme as I speak, really is internationally focused because the best minds people who are trying to frame the scientific questions, they're not just located in one country, they're located all around the world. So if you're trying to build, whether it's a spacecraft to study uh, black holes, or you're trying to study whether life originated on the surface of Mars, if you're only accessing instruments or researchers from one country, you're really not gonna be doing the best work. So you really need to collaborate with as many people as possible. Uh, because that's how you're going to get the best science. Also, from a practical point of view, any one country has limited resources. NASA has a very large space budget, but we always want to do more than we actually have the resources to do. So by collaborating with other countries, by making sure that we're not duplicating scientific efforts, to making sure that we're complementing each, complementing each other, to make sure that we're leveraging off of uh, each other's findings, each other's research, um, is really the most powerful uh, tool. Do you want this? Yeah. 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 Um, title this talk is to talk about the fact that at NASA we look outward, inward, and homeward. Because I think most people think that NASA only looks outward, that we only study the solar system and the universe. But we actually, those other two parts are just as important. The inward part is that every day up on the International Space Station, we as an international community are trying to understand the effects of microgravity uh, on the human body. And when we do that, we actually learn things that help us with human health right here on Earth. Homeward is the fact that we actually spend a lot of time looking at this planet, trying to understand our home planet Earth, um, because right now it really is the only planet we can live on and we have to make sure that we understand what's happening. And I'll go into that in some detail because obviously what's not happening uh, at the moment is not good. These are all the areas of science that we cover at NASA. We study the sun, trying to understand its long-term behavior, uh, the explosions you see there uh, uh, at the bottom of the sun are called solar flares. Really large explosions are called coronal mass ejections. Now, when these happen, they send streams of energetic particles out into space. And it actually could have a huge effect on us here on Earth. If one of these coronal mass ejections was directed directly towards Earth, 
which one hasn't in quite a long time. It can actually, ultra breath, cause your cell phones to stop working. This would obviously be a crisis. If, but you know, seriously, it can actually disrupt the communications network, it can disrupt power grids on the Earth. So trying to understand how the sun behaves um, is good, not just from a scientific point of view, but from a very practical point of view. So there's this whole area of research called space weather, where we're under, trying to understand how the sun is behaving and even get some predictive capability. And I can tell you right now, we actually have no predictive capability for space, space weather. What we do is we have a lot of satellites that, that observe the sun so that if one of these solar flares is going to send particles towards the Earth, we can put our satellites in safe modes. We can tell the astronauts up on the space station to go into a, a storm shelter. But we don't understand the sun well enough to get predictive, and that's obviously what we're, what we're aiming towards. We study the universe, and again, every time I use the word we, I mean that in a literal sense. This isn't just NASA, it's the international space community. We're trying to understand really fundamental questions, you know, how do the universe form? How do galaxies form? How do stars form? And obviously that leads us to what is the fate of our own sun, our own galaxy, our own planet. I mentioned the work we do on human health up on the International Space Station, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then, of course, there's planetary science. That's my background. I'm a planetary geologist. I study volcanoes around the solar system. Um, and the reason that we study other planets is actually to understand this planet better. The reason I'm studying volcanoes around the solar system is because, as humans, we have a tendency to live right next to volcanoes. Uh, whether you're living in Japan, the United States, Italy, chances are you're living not that far from a volcano. And so we need to understand, and get, again, back to this word prediction, we need to get predictive capability. Uh, and by studying these geologic features on other planets, we're trying to understand our own planet better. And then there's Earth science. As I mentioned, it's critically important. This is the most complex planet in the solar system. And the reason it's the most complex is because of the whole interconnected, what we call Earth system science. The fact that you have the oceans, you have the biosphere, everything living on the surface, the atmosphere, the land surfaces, they're all interacting in this very complicated way. So this slide is just meant to overwhelm you. You're not supposed to be able to read all that little tiny type or anything. This just shows the current and planned missions that we have at NASA. Up in the upper right, or sorry, upper, I don't know why I'm correct my left. In the upper uh, left is all the Earth science missions. Upper right is all our astrophysics missions. Lower left is all the missions that study the sun. Uh, and, and Sorry, that's lower left. And lower right is all the missions that are studying our solar system. So you can see, we have over 80 missions going on right now. Each of these spacecraft, in general, I can tell you who we're partnered with. So whether it's our upcoming Mars 2020 rover, where there's an instrument coming from Spain and an instrument coming from Norway, whether it's our global precipitation measurement mission that we've done in partnership with the Japanese Space Agency. Each of these missions has a partnership reaching out to some of our partners. Over its history, NASA has had over 4,000 international agreements um, with over 124 countries. Currently, we now have about 750 active agreements. Over half of those agreements are actually with a small number of partners. European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, um, Canada, uh, the UK, Italy, France, and Germany um, make up the bulk of our, our partnerships. But again, the whole reason behind this uh, is because we can say we need good relationships with this country, science is a good way to reach out and collaborate, uh, and it's been a great platform for us uh, in terms of, again, maximizing the science return. But those are the big players, and increasingly NASA is collaborating with countries from all over, uh, around the world. The Korean Space Agency, uh, space agencies from South America. Uh, uh, so our numbers of partners, the Indian Space Agency is becoming a major player. And, and so it's a constantly evolving framework, especially as, and I'll come back around to this at the end, the cost of access to space has actually been decreasing. And this is partially because we've been able to make satellites smaller and smaller. We even have something called CubeSats that are about this big, uh, that university students, high school students, there's, a, there's been an elementary school in the US, so kids about 10 or 12, 
who built their own little satellite. So when you can start doing that, all of a sudden the barrier of access to participating in space research uh, really is reduced. I wanted to start out talking about how you guys are into diplomacy now. Just think about this. So you see these little boxes on this star field. If you went outside tonight and you held up your thumb, you'd be blocking out about the area of those little boxes. In those, that area of space, our Kepler Space Telescope has been, for about the last four years, searching for planets around other stars. In just that little area of the night sky, it's found over 3,000 planets. What that has told us is that just about every star you see in the night sky has a planetary system around it, just like our solar system. And in fact, we have found other solar systems, so not just one planet around the star, but three planets, five planets, seven planets. So for me, my field, which was studying planets in our solar system, it is on the brink of this whole new era because we're going from having one solar system to study to having hundreds of solar systems to study. You know, if, you, if you've ever just tried to look at a problem from one way, you know you're probably not gonna necessarily come up with the right answer. And we've certainly found that the more we've ever learned about how our planet works, how other planet works, how other solar systems work, we found out what we've initially assumed has been wrong. And so what we stand to learn over the next several decades as we study these planetary systems around other stars, it's gonna be amazing. And a number of these planets, and this is just an artist's conception of about the 20 some planets we found that sit in what we call the habitable zone. This is the distance from a parent star where liquid water could be present on the surface. And the reason that's important is that we think that water is critical to life. Life originated here in the oceans uh, on Earth and it stayed in the oceans for over a billion years. So when we look for life beyond Earth, when we're trying to answer that question of are, are we alone in the universe, looking for planets in this habitable zone, um, and, and it's even been sometimes termed the, the, the Goldilocks zone, in the case of our sol solar system, Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, and the Earth is just right. So we're looking for these potentially habitable planets. The next step is we have a telescope that's launching in 2018 called the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb will start looking at the atmospheres. Right now we've only been detecting how big the planet is and what distance it sits from its parent star. James Webb will start looking for gases in the atmosphere of these planets like carbon dioxide, water, oxygen, methane that might be indicative of life. So a whole new era that we're walking into. Um, this is actually a stamp, uh, a postage stamp that just got released in the U.S., but I, I really, I really love it for because it's really pretty pictures of, of each of the planets in, in our solar system. To show you again is now we're thinking about these habitable planets around other stars. We come back to our own solar system and say, well, how come we only got it right once in our solar system? Why is the Earth the only blue planet? with green stuff on it, so you know there's something living on the surface. Why is that? You know, when I mentioned this Goldilocks idea, was Venus, that orange planet, was it too hot? Mercury's too close to the sun. Its outer surface was actually blasted away early in its history. Mars, I'm gonna talk a lot about. Maybe Mars, at one point, was habitable. Maybe life did evolve on Mars. And then the giant planets of the outer solar system. And that's, those planets are actually challenging our concept of how important the habitable zone really is. Uh, because some of the moons of these giant planets in the outer solar system actually could also harbor life. And we're quite excited about that. I didn't want to leave out this place. I showed you the eight planets of our solar system. Most of you might know uh, this place. Can anybody tell me what this place is? Anybody know? It's Pluto. Yeah, this is Pluto. So last summer, we flew a spacecraft uh, past Pluto called the New Horizons spacecraft. So Pluto, you know, used to be a planet, and then it got demoted to be a dwarf planet. And this was actually done, uh, and this is another issue of, of how the internet and how the space community acts, 
as an international community. Mm -hmm. So there's actually an interna international astronomical union um, that's responsible for classifying objects in the solar system and naming objects in the solar system. For example, I sit on the International Astronomical Union Commission on Planetary Nomenclature Subcommittee on Venus Nomenclature. <laughs> <laughs> And it's because I complained. They were naming, everything on Venus is named after a woman. Um, you have to be dead for more than five years so that you're really dead, not just kind of dead. Um, you can't, there has to be balance between all the cultures of the world. Um, you can't be a political or religious figure. So there's all these rules you have to follow. And they had named um, a crater on Venus Mona Lisa. And I'm like, okay, A, that was the name of a painting, not an actual woman. Um, she actually did have a name. Um, and it's named after a painting that was painted by man, so what the heck. Um, <laughs> so I complained so much, they put me on the committee. Uh, a lesson, don't complain unless you're willing to be on the committee. But anyway, so w what happened with Pluto is it turns out in the asteroid belt, which is a, a belt of material between Mars and Jupiter, there are actually about three large circular bodies, uh, two of which we've just been visiting, Vesta and Ceres, that are actually on the size of Pluto, if not a little larger. Out in the Kuiper Belt, which is where Pluto sits, this belt of, again, sort of asteroid material, material left over from when the planets formed, out, out past um, Neptune and Uranus, uh, there's at least about eight other Pluto-sized round bodies. So the idea was if you have all of these potential small bodies, can they all be planets that every kid in the on the planet would have to be memorizing the names of like 22 planets instead of eight. So, you know, it was easier to demote Pluto. So anyway, poor Pluto got demoted. The fascinating thing about Pluto, and you can see this weird surface, this is actually looking at the horizon. So those hazy layers you see at the top are actually Pluto's atmosphere. Those are clouds in the atmosphere. Those are ice mountains in front of you and a smooth ice plain off to the side. Pluto should have looked like our moon. It's very tiny. It's about a third the size of our moon. So we think planets, how they, how busy they are on their surface, how geologically active they are, has a lot to do with how big they are. Because you need heat, basically, to drive geologic processes. That heat comes from what's going on inside the planet. Maybe it's being pulled on by a large neighbor. Maybe it has radioactive elements inside that are decaying and producing heat. Okay, none of those apply to Pluto. So why Pluto has mountains, Pluto even has a volcano, we actually don't know. So it's really cool, because we expected Pluto to look kind of boring, frankly, big impact craters, not much going on. Instead, it's incredibly active, really fascinating. We don't know what's going on. And when you don't know what's going on, that's when you're really going to learn something. But the big question that we're really dealing with right now at NASA and space agencies from around the world is this question of are we alone? Uh, and it's this really fundamental question that I think humankind has always wondered about. The amazing thing is we now live in an era where we know where to go, we know what to measure, we have the technology to go measure it. It's just a question of doing it. So that's what we're doing. So whether it's exploring Mars that I'll talk more about because we know Mars had a wet past, back to that issue of water being important for life. Whether it's Europa or Enceladus, Europa is a moon of Jupiter, Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. Uh, these are those outer planets, giant planet satellites that I said were kind of challenging that concept of the habitable zone. You even have a place like Titan, uh, which is this moon here up in the upper left. Titan is a moon of Saturn. It's the only moon in the solar system that actually has a substantial atmosphere. It rains. There are rivers, there are lakes and seas on the surface of Titan. But on Titan, it's about 92 degrees Kelvin. That's like minus 300 and something uh, centigrade. So that rain, those rivers, those lakes, that's not water. It's actually liquid methane and li liquid ethane. So it's like liquid gasoline, basically, liquid petrol um, uh, that's falling from the sky, evaporating, doing everything our water cycle does here on the Earth. So fascinating. So could there be life without water? You don't know. Let's go find out. So these outer planet uh, satellites are really fascinating because of this idea, if you're trying to follow the water to find life, habitable zones don't just sit a certain distance from stars, they could be satellites of much larger bodies, which makes our 
search for life beyond our solar system more difficult. So the question we're really pushing on right now with all these satellites in the old outer solar system is how common is life? How hard is it to get life going? And by studying all these bodies, by seeing, can we find some kind of microbes or bacteria on every single one? Can we find any more advanced life in the oceans on Europa underneath its icy crust? This will help us understand how common life is uh, in general. But Mars is really our focus uh, because we know that about four billion years ago, uh, Mars had water on its surface just like the Earth did. Life here on Earth evolved about 3.8, 3.9 million years ago. Wet planet, different atmosphere than we have today. Very similar conditions of that same time period on Mars. Life evolved very quickly here on Earth once conditions stabilized. But again, it stayed in the oceans for a long time and stayed very simple. Single cell, multi cell life forms, algae basically for a long time. The problem with Mars is Mars is about a third the size of the Earth. So Mars started to cool off. It lost its protective magnetic field that was shielding its atmosphere from those particles streaming from the sun that we call the solar wind. And Mars's atmosphere started to get stripped away. The planet got colder, the colder the water evaporated, it started to get stripped away. So life either on Mars either went extinct or it retreated underground as the water went underground and froze. And we don't know which but we know where to go, and we know how to, how to find out. This picture was taken by our Curiosity rover, and I love it because you would believe me, but it's not. <laughs> it's, <more so. laughs> it's really beautiful. So this is a place called Gale Crater. That's Mount Sharp up behind. And what the rover, our Curiosity rover is doing is you see all those layers of rocks. Well, to a geologist, those layers of rock are, are like pages in a history book. So we want to go read each of those pages. What were the conditions like that time in the past on Mars? And what we've been finding out is, again, that Mars had this long, wet history where the conditions are complex things. And Mars, without a magnetic field, is actually getting a lot of radiation from the sun, from, from what we call galactic cosmic rays, high energy particles that come in uh, from outside the galaxy or from deep in our galaxy. Those break up organic molecules. That's why radiation is bad for humans, because it breaks up our mo molecules, it damages our DNA. So our Curiosity rover right now has only been finding basically pieces of organic molecules, because they've been long broken up by radiation. So the question is, if you added them all back up together, would they make something living? Or are they just organic molecules that are, are produced some other way? We know that comets and asteroids delivered Basically, the building blocks of life, amino acids, are found in comets. So those building blocks of life were delivered at, at everywhere. The question is, did the reactions take place, did the reactions proceed, that actually led to something self-replicating, that evolves, that eats something and gives something else off, which is basically our definition of life. Now, this chart is a little out of date, but so to try to answer these questions about Mars, we as an international community have had a whole program of exploring Mars, and this means a bunch of them, a bunch of them actually all. We just had the Trace Gas Orbiter uh, there at the top 2016 go into orbit, it's a European Space Agency mission, go into orbit around Mars. Uh, we had um, the Mars Orbiter mission, which is an Indian mission that's up there. In 2020, the UAE is gonna launch uh, a mission to Mars. Uh, and we have our 2020 rover and the ExoMars rover, which is an ESA rover that's also going to launch in 2020. Um, again, that's in this chart is a little out of date. So as we use all these things to explore Mars, we're again trying to figure out where's the water, where are the places to go that we think it's most likely that life could have potentially evolved. Now when we go to Mars, that's actually governed by, governed by an international treaty. The most important one for Mars is something called uh, it's a treaty that governs what we call planetary protection. And the idea behind the treaty is, which has been signed by all the major spacefaring nations, is um, we don't want to contaminate Mars with Earth bacteria. Basically because we're trying to figure out did life evolve on Mars. So if we go there and are like, wow, look, we found something that we brought home, you know, from home with us, that's not a good thing. 
So it sets up a process by which for uh, people from, if you're sending a spacecraft to Mars, you have to go through all these extra levels of sterilization. We know that doesn't kill everything, but we try to characterize what, what is left on the, on the spacecraft really well so that we know, okay, what kind of contamination are we taking and we really minimize it. That's what we call forward contamination. We're also, not surprisingly, kind of concerned about backward contamination. If we bring samples back, from other bodies, or if, for example, those sa uh, samples were being carried by someone, can we be sure we're not going to contaminate the Earth and endanger people here on Earth by contaminating the Earth with potentially harmful microbes from another planet? And so that is going to govern when we bring samples back from Mars, which we're currently in the process of working on, and when we eventually send humans to Mars and then bring them back to the Earth, we're going to have to develop all these international protocols for how we make sure that when the astronauts come back, there's no chance that they're going to contaminate the Earth uh, with bacteria from another planet. And it really is this issue of getting humans to Mars that we're very focused on as an international exploration community. Um, I'm a field geologist, so I go out and wander around volcanoes. Um, and so I think it's really important. You can say, why send humans? Why not just, especially with that potential large microbe thing, you know, why send humans? Why not just send robots? You know, humans are creative, we're flexible, we move fast. For example, our Opportunity rover has been on Mars about 12 years. It's gone about 27 miles in 12 years. Most of us could go 27 miles, so we walk quicker than, well, I can't run a marathon, but still. Um, you know, most of us can move quite rapidly. So even though our robotics technologies are getting better, they're not the equivalent of the human. So we're really working on how do we get humans to Mars? How can we do this in the next 20 years, which is the goal of President Obama? So we've really split this into three phases, and we're working very closely with our, with our international partners. In fact, you can go on the web. There's something called the uh, ISEG, it's I-S-E-C-G. Um, and it's the international, um, I forget what the, the initials, but it's the international basically global exploration roadmap. So all the space agencies of the world have come together and have been working. Can we come up with a stepwise plan that gets us from where we are now in what we call the Earth Reliant phase where we're working on the International Space Station to humans on Mars around 2033? For the US, we've laid out a strategy where we're doing this in a stepwise fashion, again, focusing on the International Space Station right now building a new rocket called the Space Launch System that will be able to launch humans into deep space. In the mid-2020s, we're going to go out to what we call the proving ground, which is putting humans in orbit around the moon. Now, why do that? A couple reasons. One is we can practice the systems for getting to Mars, but you can get home from the moon in about three days. Once you're on the way to Mars, it's seven to eight months to Mars, at least that long to get back. And you can't start out and then change your mind and turn around. So we really want to make sure that our systems are reliable. And, and I'll get to, to the problems with some of our systems right now. So how are we going to do this? Okay, so we're going to focus on the space station through the mid-2020s. Then in the mid-2020s, we're going to put this habitat, basically this, the basis for the Mars transfer vehicle, in orbit around the moon. In the late 2020s, we're actually going to try a round-trip um, robotic what we call precursor mission, where we'll send a mission to Mars, land on the surface with a lot of mass, because that's one of the things that's hard to do is land a lot of stuff on Mars. We're going to pick up some samples, launch them off the surface, uh, rendezvous in orbit, and bring that back to the Earth. So it's kind of practicing the trip to Mars, but not getting humans there to make sure we know how to do it. And then in about 2033, we'll have the first human mission to Mars, and that will likely be an orbital mission because that landing, as we saw from last week, um, when the Europeans had trouble landing a uh, craft on the surface of Mars, the U.S. has had trouble, lots of countries have had trouble landing on the surface of Mars. It's hard. Um, and so we want to have that first mission be an orbital mission, then we'll get humans down to the surface in the late 2030s. But it really does begin at the space station because we need this orbiting platform to understand the effects uh, on humans of microgravity. When you go into basically zero G, your bones lose density, your muscles start wasting, you actually develop vision problems, your uh, 
your whole uh, immune system starts to lose function. So going into space is actually not great for humans, but what we've been doing for these last 16 years as an international community on the space station is working to try to figure out how can we keep humans healthy, and we actually are pretty good at that now. Um, in fact, uh, we just had two, uh, an astronaut and a cosmonaut, um, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko, just spent three, about 340 days in space, almost a year. Uh, we had Tim Peake, obviously, as one of the crew uh, last year up on the ISS, Samantha Christopheretti uh, there, who's uh, an Italian astronaut. So what these people have been doing on the ISS is developing basically protocols to try to counteract these effects of microgravity so that we can say, okay, by the time we're ready to send astronauts to Mars, after that seven months in space, they're gonna be able to deal with emergencies. They're gonna be healthy enough that they're gonna be able to do work um, and be ready for any eventuality. And that's a lot of what the astronauts are doing on the ISS, as well as developing technologies uh, that, that we need for this Mars exploration. Now, Again, going to Mars is really hard, and this is just some of it. I talked about how difficult it is to land on Mars. Uh, when you launch back up off the surface, you need rocket fuel, so are you gonna make that rocket fuel on Mars, or are you actually going to uh, have to bring it with you? Bringing it with you has a huge penalty because you have to land it on the surface just to launch it back off again. Um, Mars has this very thin atmosphere. That's what makes landing on Mars so, so hard. It's enough of an atmosphere to really heat you up as you come in, but it doesn't slow you down very much. It's like the worst atmosphere you can think of. One of the other problems, frankly, with sending humans to Mars is the isolation. And so we actually have uh, international work going on where we're working on how do humans work as teams in isolated environments. We do that in Antarctica. Uh, and we've run, um, the Europeans have led a, uh, an experiment, the Russians have led experiments where we've worked on how do, we, how do we make teams work well together when they're isolated for long periods of time. We also have the issue that when humans are at Mars, there's about a half an hour delay time in communications from the Earth. It just takes at the speed of light the signal to go that far. Can't get around it. So just think if you're at Mars and you haven't seen your family in eight months, and you go to call them and you say hello, and a half, an hour later, you hear, what? <laughs> <laughs> Start over again. So, you know, we can laugh about it, but just think how hard that would be, especially with this isolation. So we worry about that. How do you worry about astronauts' mental health? So that's a big issue. How do you feed them? If you think about how much food we throw away on the Earth because it goes bad, we're talking about medications and food that have to be shelf-stable for very long periods of time. That has huge Earth benefit, though. Just think about having medications that can be stable for long periods of time, don't have to be refrigerated. That's critical in countries all around the world that have access to those kind of medications. So in pushing these technologies to go to Mars, we benefit life right here on Earth. So I mentioned uh, that we're, and NASA are building a big rocket, but we're also really increasingly par partnering with the private sector. Um, NASA's gonna start launching astronauts to the International Space Station with Boeing and SpaceX Corporation uh, next year, uh, which is really exciting. We already have three companies, Orbital ATK, SpaceX, and, uh, and Sierra Nevada Corporation taking cargo up to the International Space Station. In the meantime, uh, we have, we're building our own rocket, the Space Launch System. That's this rocket that's big enough to actually get humans out to the vicinity of the moon. I want to switch topics in the time I have left um, to talk about climate change, because as I said in the beginning, we have all these satellites studying this planet. Uh, this is average surface temperature um, going from the 1940s up to the, up to the present day. It's just going to cycle through this. Um, it's no surprise to any of you that this map is going to show that temperatures are getting warmer and warmer and warmer as we move to the current day. And obviously every month of this year has broken temperature records. Um, every single month. And you can see the, the, as it plays again, you can watch and you can see the warming isn't uniform. The warming has been really outscale in the Arctic for reasons that we don't totally understand, uh, really high in sub-Saharan Africa. And as climate change moves forward, even if we do a job that we need to do to reduce emissions, some of these effects of climate change are gonna continue because we've just put too much carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere. 
Uh, and, and so this is something we're extremely concerned about at NASA. So what is NASA doing? Well, it's our job basically to make observations, to try to understand what's happening. This is data from a, uh, our gray satellite, which measures gravity, but you can actually use that data to look at ice sheets. And you can see how much mass we've been losing off the Greenland ice sheet over about the last 10 years. This is a huge amount of ice that's melting. That water's all going, that fresh water is all going into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, if we, we are also melting the, the polar ice cap in the Arctic, but when you melt sea ice, you don't increase sea level. When you melt ice off land, you, you raise sea level. We were already expecting on the order of a meter of sea level rise, a half meter to a meter of sea level rise by, by the end of the century just due to the thermal expansion of the ocean. So as the ocean gets hotter, the water actually is bigger. It takes up more room. So just due to rising temperatures, we were already expecting half a meter to a meter of sea level rise. What NASA and the other space agencies have been measuring in loss of ice in Greenland, in Western Antarctica, has the potential to add another half meter to meter to that amount. Now, most countries of the world, certainly including the United States, have huge areas of land that sit, and, and major cities that sit maybe a half meter above, above the sea level, a lot of the times right at sea level. Huge concern, uh, and this is the kind of thing that we're measuring. Some areas are getting too much water, some are getting too little. This is, again, Grace data. This is over California, you can see, from 2002 to 2014. That red color that you're seeing is actually the ground dropping. As there's been no rain in California, there's been a protracted drought, farmers use about 85% of the water in California, and California produces about 40% of the, the U.S.'s fresh produce. So as we've been pulling water out of the ground, the subsurface aquifer to water those crops, the ground has actually been dropping so much that we can measure it from space. Um, and unfortunately, this past year, we thought California was going to get a lot of rain. They got a moderate amount in Northern California, Southern California got almost none. Um, so this drought is continuing, the ground is continuing to, to drop or continuing to deplete uh, uh, the water resources. And this is also uh, going on in, 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 uh, in India. So we're trying to use our satellites to say what's happening around the world, what's happening right now, and then can we use these data to model projections out into the future to say what is going to happen. Um, these are uh, uh, rainfall data uh, over and it's showing severe storms over part of the, the U.S. Um, and part of the, again, I was showing California, which had too little water. Um, this, these are areas that were getting too much water, just as bad for crops but also resulting in huge flooding um, in that area you can see down there, which is uh, uh, Texas, the Texas-Louisiana border, where we had a lot of people die in, in flooding incidents. So huge issues um, as we move into climate change, uh, as the climate continues to warm, and we get more incidents of severe weather. The good news is in California, for example, NASA's been working with farmers to access data where we observe plant health, we actually observe soil moisture, and in a pilot program, we actually got farmers to reduce water usage by up to 25%. But that's in California. What about people around the world? NASA has partnered with the U.S. Agency for International Development to create a program we call SERVIR, from the Spanish word to serve. We have offices in Kathmandu, uh, in Nairobi, in Niamey, Niger, in Bangkok. Uh, and in, in Central America, where we are going out into countries, we're working with local universities, local ministries of the interior, and saying, what are your issues? Is it flooding? Is it drought? Is it, uh, are you worried about sea level rise? Are you worried about storm surge? Uh, and how can we help you learn how to use all this earth science data that's being returned to turn it into information to help you make decisions? We can let you know what, what the temperatures and precipitation in your country are gonna be like 20 years from now, so we can help you plan maybe how your agriculture needs to change over the next several decades due to climate change. So it's a huge emphasis with the president and with this administration to say, how can we use all this earth science data we collect, not just for the scientific community, but to help people around the world become more resilient to the effects of climate change. I wanted to end just um, talking to me, you know, letting you know a little bit of my story. So. This, this amazing rocket that you see at the top here. Um, my father worked for NASA. He's a funny looking guy. That's my sister and I. Um, 
when I was about four years old. So when I was about that age, um, I went to my first rocket launch because my father was a rocket scientist at NASA. And it actually blew up on the pad. That's the actual first launch that I went to. It was one of the early, it was uncrewed. It was one of the early launches. Um, and they were still, NASA was still trying to figure out how to launch rockets. Um, and so it blew up on the pad, and it's a really dramatic thing, which I always tell people that's probably why I never wanted to become an astronaut. I've seen a lot of rockets blow up. Um, you know, and then I went on to become a scientist out studying volcanoes. Uh, that's me in Hawaii with some colleagues of mine. Uh, and, and then eventually came to work at NASA where I get to do fun things like do outreach with kids doing robotics. Um, that's me um, talking to some students in uh, South Africa a few years ago. Um, and, and for me and my job, international outreach is a huge part of it. I travel around the world doing things like I'm doing today, talking to people about Na what NASA is doing, about the importance of um, international relationships, talking about climate change. I especially like talking to kids around the world because all these effects of climate change I've been talking about, every country in the world, it's critical for them to have a strong STEM workforce because the challenges of climate, climate change are gonna be civil engineering challenges. They're gonna be medical challenges as disease vectors change because of changing climate and changing rainfall patterns. Every country needs this strong STEM workforce to help them be resilient to the effects of climate change. And one of the things that's really important to me is to talk about underrepresented groups in STEM. In the United States, um, still, the majority of scientists, engineers, computer science, mathematicians are white men. Uh, Hispanics, African Americans, women, we're underrepresented. And that's unacceptable because you're not going to solve the tough problems that we have in front of us if you're only accessing a little portion of your population. If you want to solve tough problems, and I don't care what country in the world you're in, you've really got to make sure everybody's welcome. Are you harnessing the talent of your population? And so to me, that's why getting out there and, for example, showing all these different women that work at NASA is so important because it is really critical that we harness all of our population because we want to do cool things like turn our Mars robots that are trying to find life into Mars astronauts that are trying to find life. And we want that first crew that goes to Mars to be an international crew. We want them to look like all of us look, not just a bunch of white guys. So anyway, not, not that we don't want the crew to also have that representation. But um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks for this fascinating, uh, intellectual, challenging, and fabulous talk. When we spoke about uh, uh, women in STEM, yes? So, and you mentioned that uh, planets, uh, they are given feminist names like Venus, etc. So we all know that earthquakes and hurricanes are also given uh, feminist names names. So, they, they uh, uh, so we can see the <laughs> positive element yeah. in your talk, not only the negative earthquakes and the hurricane. Um, take questions, yes, from Philippines at the side. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, uh, exciting presentation. Uh, you talk about uh, international cooperation in, uh, in uh, launching uh, missions to space. My question is, who owns the findings? Is it owned by all the stakeholders or just several countries? Or are we seeing a move to consider them as a property of humanity? Um, NASA has always had a policy of open data. So while there's usually a period of time where we validate the data that some used to last for like over a year, we now try to get it down to three to six months where we make sure, you know, are the data organized and are they labeled and are they, you know, findable. Um, and, and so within that time period, a lot of our data we literally put out as soon as it hits the ground. Others, we have to do some processing, so it takes that kind of three month maybe period to get it out. But we have a strong policy of open data. So any, any NASA mission that, that you saw today, you could go on the web and find the raw data as well as derived products. We have a whole center called the EOS DIS, EOS EIS, that you could Google where all our Earth science data is held. We have a new platform called Open NEX, NEX, the NASA Earth Exchange, and also the NASA Earth Exchange, where you can access a lot of our Earth science data. 
we believe very strongly, and we always have, that we collect this data, it should be, it should be broadly available. The problem is, it's often hard to use. So we actually have a new effort called PREP, or the Partnership for Resilience and Preparedness, where we're working with people like Google, Microsoft, IBM, the World Resource Institute, the World Bank, 13 countries from around the world to say, how can we make the data actually easy to use and easily accessible, easily findable for non-experts who want to try to understand even things like, um, can I look at data to see how a refugee camp in this region might be growing? You know, because you can do that really easily from space. So lots of uses for space-based data in humanitarian work, um, not just in climate resilience. Um, we even have a new policy that's come out from under President Obama that all publications that use government data and the data behind the figures in those publications have to be made public and accessible within a year of publication. Um, so we now have something called um, NASA PubSpace where you can go and download NASA publications. Um, obviously before, they were often held behind firewalls and journals, but the president felt strongly the US government is funding it, should be available. Now obviously there are um, uh, some restrictions based on the, the subject material that falls under what we call ITAR, the International Treaty on Arms Regulation. You know, if it's sensitive technology stuff, it's not going to be widely available, but the far bulk, um, and especially of our actual data, all freely available. Other countries have different policies. That's been very much NASA's policy, and we very much advocated that on an international. I was just earlier this week, I was at an international heads of space agencies meeting um, in Trento, Italy, and this was one of the conversations that I was having. It's really talking about NASA's open data policy because I think it's critical, um, especially given the fact of climate change. You can argue, okay, like, does anybody really care if our Pluto data is available? But when you're talking about countries that could be suffering from the effects of climate change, and we have space-based data that can help them, um, I, I think that data should be easily available and accessible and understandable. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, my name is Winnie, Winnie the Pool. Mm -hmm. I come from China, and I have a question because I'm recently, uh, recently research, uh, did some research about women leadership, and I was curious that what is the biggest difficulties you, over, um, you, you are facing as a woman leader? This is different from leader leaderships and manage, right? Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, I would say two parts. You know, o over my career, it's probably been the hardest thing for me has just been balancing all the inputs in my life. So I have three children. They're 28, 24, and 20. Um, and, and so, um, you know, trying to balance between my career and my family was hard. Um, a lot of the times, I wish I could go back to my younger self and say, don't be so hard on yourself. My kids are all fine. You know, none of them became, you know, criminal. Um, <laughs> so they're all really great people. And, and at the time, though, I was always like really critical of my being a good enough mom if I'm going to go to Hawaii and go study my volcano. Um, so I think that's hard for women because I think we put more pressure on ourselves to try to be perfect in every area of our lives, and we need to learn to cut ourselves some slack. Your kids will be fine; they won't be criminal. Um, and the other thing that I think is hard is. When you look around a room, you know, when I go into a room, in general, I'm mostly looking at men. And then you start to wonder, do I, do I belong here? Because I don't see many people who look like me. So to me, it's been more of a self-doubt issue where I start to say, do I belong here? And, and I, I always try to remember the story of a woman named Katherine Johnson. Um, she was a mathematician at NASA in the early 1960s. Um, she actually calculated the trajectories for us sending the first humans into space. Um, at that time, women were actually kind of kept in a room where they did all the math, math and they were called computers because this was before electronic computers. Um, and eventually they knew she was so good, they like invited her into the meeting room. And at some point someone turned to her and said, you know, you should go back in the room with all those women. And she said, no, I belong here. Yeah. And so I always try to channel my inner Catherine Johnson and try to say I shouldn't be just because there's no one who looks like me doesn't mean that I don't belong here and I should be opening the door and letting lots of other women in. The thing I didn't tell you about Katherine Johnson is she's actually African American. And this was the 1960s in southeastern Virginia where she wasn't allowed to go into movie theaters with white people and here she was carrying the nation's space program on her back. Uh, and uh, President Obama just gave her the Medal of Freedom which is the highest civilian honor in the 
West last year, and there's a movie coming out about her. I'm not as a US government employee, not allowed to uh, urge you to see a movie, but it's called Hidden Figures, and it's about Katherine Johnson. You can watch the, um, it's really exciting at NASA. We're just like, ah, we're so excited now. Um, where are you? Where are you, Yes, hi, my name's Paul. Um, the question I have for you, um, when we look at climate change and we look at you know, various summits and agreements on what to do about so, you know, our planet and some of the statistics and research are being ignored, what kind of um, predictions um, can NASA do or what science can they and evidence can they use to persuade um, the current decision making process when it's you know, poor decisions are being made? You know, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and what we try to do at NASA is to try to put the evidence out there. And, and you know, every time I give a talk, I, I show these slides I showed you. You know, the planet is warming. It's not a model. It, it's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's happening right now. We already see it. And so to me, at NASA, we are keep trying to put out media releases, we put out data, we've got these cute little cartoon YouTube videos called Earth Minute, where we take complex concepts like melting of ice and sea level rise and greenhouse atmospheres, and we explain it in really simple language so that everyone can understand it. But it's very difficult because a lot of people are skeptical. A lot of people think it's happening in the future, it's not happening now. And it, it makes it very difficult. It's been very frustrating for the scientific community to, to have this difficulty in getting, getting the point across. And I, I feel like it's up to all of us to keep talking about climate change, to talk to our stakeholders about climate change and say, look, we need to do something about this. COP21 is a good start, but it doesn't get us to that two degree centigrade mark that the scientists want us to get to. We're trying to hold uh, global warming for climate change to two degrees centigrade. Right now we're on a path to exceed that. COP21 brought us back a little bit, but we're still going to exceed that, uh, that two degrees centigrade mark. So we need to do more than the agreements that are in COP21. It's incredibly serious. To me, this is the most serious issue we face as a planet, uh, as a species. Question. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Stephen, for your talk. It was absolutely fantastic. And um, we're streaming it live on our Facebook page, on Loughborough University's Facebook page. And I wanted to pose a question that one of our viewers has asked you. Um, he asks, how does NASA see itself working with private sector such as Elon Musk, SpaceX? You know, we, um, NASA, to some extent, has always partnered with the private sector. Even the Apollo program, we had lots of um, industrial partners to you know, help build our spacecraft. Um, but we're really entering this interesting new era where NASA is increasingly trying to turn over to the private sector what we don't need to do anymore. You know, we're the government. We should be pushing the boundaries. We should be pushing the envelope. We should be investing in things that no one else wants to invest in. So we partner with SpaceX. They take cargo to the International Space Station. They'll be taking crew to the International Space Station starting next year. We're even partnering with them on one of my favorite things called Red Dragon. They want to take one of their crew capsules and they want to send it to Mars and land it on Mars in 2018. Now, their crew capsule weighs about five metric tons. Our Curiosity rover weighed one metric ton. We haven't totally finished the technology work to land more than that. SpaceX is working on it. It's, a, it's something called supersonic retropropulsion that they use when they land their first stage back on that cool drunk barge. So they're working on the technology. Let's partner with them. Let's leverage off what they're doing. I don't think we're going to get humans to Mars, which is my goal. I want to see this happen within my lifetime. We're not going to get there unless we partner with the private sector, unless we go as an international community. So I think all of these partnerships are really critical. Thank you. Thank you so much for telling us this interesting story about NASA. And my question is, as a scientist researcher, when you do research about exploring the fantastic outside space, and when you explore the volcanoes, what's your core motivation for doing that? I, I'm just very curious. Thank you. You know, as a scientist, and this drives my children and you know my husband crazy. You know, it's always, <laughs> you know, it, it's always I just want to know why. You know, why is something that way? And can we figure it out? And, and I think you know I love doing puzzles. You know, and 
And I think it's just this, I think most scientists I know, they're really just, they're just incredibly curious. And so it's not enough for me to look at those layers of rock. I want to know why. You know, how did they form? What, what do they tell you? You know, how does a volcano work? How, how can we understand how it works and then, and then use that information to help humanity? And, and so I think it's those two parts have always really driven me, just kind of an innate curiosity. Um, and I think it's really cool and fun. I get to go wander around volcanoes. How cool is that? Um, and then this issue of you feel like you're doing something for a greater good. I'm not just studying volcanoes because they're cool and fun, which they are, but I'm doing it because it's really important for humanity to understand how volcanoes work because we live way too close to them and we need to protect people. Okay. Hello, Dr. Thank you for your lecture. But my question is, what do you think about other forms of extraterrestrial life? You know, for example, the silicon based biology, they don't need the link in the water. So if they have any possible other research moves that's wrong, use the link in the water as a symbol of life. I'm, I'm really glad you, answered, you asked that question because, you know, I, I just presented this whole talk on like water, water, water. And, and that really is, that is the bulk of the astrobiology community is focused on the fact that they think water is really important. Um, and it's partially because of the properties of the water molecule, you know, it's a bipolar charged molecule, things dissolve in water, and when you have uh, water as a solid, so when you have things dissolved in water, that means there's all kinds of, um, of uh, atoms that are accessible like as nutrients for, for um, enhancing chemical reactions. So there's a, you know, lots of science nerd reasons why water is important. That being said, we don't know. You know, we have one data point. And in the past, when you have one data point and you develop huge and giant theories based around your one data point, you're normally not correct. And, and so that's why I love Titan. And I actually had proposed to NASA to send a, a boat, a floating probe to that methane sea on, on Saturn's moon. Um, because to me, Titan pushes those assumptions. It says, what are the limits to life? Could we be wrong that water's important? Um, you know, is life on other planets? Mars can even help us answer the question. Is life that we find elsewhere, is it going to have RNA and DNA? Which all life on Earth has RNA and DNA. So is that right? Or, you know, what is life on another body going to look like? And again, for people who say, okay, this is all boring. I don't, I, you know, I don't care if there's life. It's, it doesn't apply to me. And my, you know, I say to them, this has the potential to help us here on Earth because when we can understand other living organisms, it pushes our understanding of ourselves, and that helps push medicine forward. It helps push technology forward. So I think there's a bigger importance, but we need to go to places like Titan to help push that envelope. Of, is water really the answer? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, I want to ask a question about the, the policy. Mm -hmm. So you space policy of the United States since 2006. Uh, how do you think about it? Uh, because somebody believes that that might be against the WMD. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the policy since 2006. For the, the new policy of, of, of the United States, the space policy. Um, what is the, we have, I, I'm sorry, because we have a lot of space policy, so I'm not sure specifically uh, what aspect America refused to to, to ban uh, space weapon. Yeah, that's outside of my my area because Na NASA we don't we don't deal with we don't deal with policy. We're not a regulatory agency. We just basically you know and we don't deal. Um, we're actually signed on to the UN peaceful use of space treaty. Um, NASA only uses space for peace, peaceful uses. So um, and the U.S. has signed on to the peaceful use of space. Hi, I had a question um, regarding the individuals that you'll be sending to Mars and how you train them. I was curious to know if that's being outsourced or if you're um, training them in house with NASA responsible for that. Uh, um, you know, right now we actually, for example, the Europeans train the European astronauts, the Russians train the Russian astronauts, and then when we go to the space station, um, they do training together as a crew so that they can function as a crew. Um, my guess is, you know, we haven't planned this out yet, but my guess is whether it's a cruise we'll be sending to the Cislunar Habitat, which again will be international crews, they won't just be NASA astronauts. And then when we get that first crew to go to Mars, they'll be probably trained in their own countries, and then they'll come together for final training so that they mesh 
as a group because that's where that whole group dynamics, isolation, long time periods, you've got to get people to function as a team. So that last phase of, of, um, of training is, is critically important and that's how we do it now. I think we probably do it in the same way. And will that be a diverse group of people? That it will be a diverse, it will be a diverse group of people. Hi, Dr. Allen. Thank you for a fantastic speech. My question is, uh, when you're collaborating with other countries, how do you allocate the resources, like the funding? Great, great question. In general, we use a format called a Space Act Agreement, and almost always it's done on a no exchange of funds basis. Um, so we will say, for example, the Europeans right now are um, providing the European um, uh, what's called like a service module that goes underneath the Orion capsule, which will sit on our space launch system rocket, which will take humans out to the vicinity of the moon. So it's done on a barter basis usually, so no, no exchange of funds. So um, Europe will provide that. Sometimes there's some payment to industry, but in general, governments don't give other governments money in these cases. It's usually, again, some sort of barter agreement. Um, we might say, well, you'll have astronauts, or, or you'll provide something, we'll provide something for you. So it's usually done on that. Basis. Um, it's rarely done on an actual exchange of funds. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Stuart. I just had a question. We spoke to begin with about Pluto and how it got sort of. Uh, yeah. um, what's sort of the latest on is it Planet Nine? They were saying that. Is, is that just a theory or is that actually if they sort of found something? You know, what amazed me, and I, I could only follow this on Twitter, there was a big, um, there was a big meeting last week of, of planetary science and astrophysicists. I think it was the double A of that. American Astronomical Society um, meeting. I actually it was the Division of Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society. And there was a whole session on Planet Nine. And I hadn't realized how much was going on. And so my knowledge of this is based on several 140 character tweets <laughs> about presentations that were being made in the session. So obviously what I'm saying is based on what you're saying. Um, but given that, I'll happily answer the question. Um, so what a lot of people have now been doing is certainly there are people who are looking for Planet Nine because obviously the proposal that there's this ninth planet way out there, that people looked at the Kuiper Belt and said, if you look at the arrangement of material and the arrangement of the planets, if you, if you postulate there's a large planet out beyond that, that kind of makes everything make sense. So these guys put forward this paper, you know, it was met with some degree of skepticism by the scientific community, but people have been looking for Planet Nine, it hasn't been found yet, but again, big space out there. Um, and in the meantime, people have been developing a lot of other theories and a lot of other models. And I guess that was what was mostly being presented last week. So it seems there's a lot of people in the scientific community who are taking it very, fairly seriously and are trying to say, look, a lot of the data we're seeing, it really does make sense to have Planet Nine. Hasn't been found, will remain a theory until we get more data. But I, I was actually surprised by the amount of new science it's actually generating, which is cool. Um, apparently, diplomatic relations between the United States and Russia are a bit tense at the moment politically. I'm just wondering, do you have scientific cooperation with Russia <laughs> despite the tense relations? Yeah, and you know, people have actually nominated the International Space Station for the Nobel uh, Peace Prize because here over the last, um, you know, 14, or 16 years, we've had Canada, Japan, the European <coughs> Space Agency, the United States, and Russia working together every day up in space, moving science and technology forward, despite what's been going on on the ground. I actually did my PhD thesis on Soviet then Soviet data of, of Venus, and I was going to the Soviet Union to work on my thesis data with the, with the, with the Russian scientists at a time when the US and the Soviet Union weren't getting along very well at all. I think those kind of people-to-people, scientist-to-scientist relationships are really critical to help keep countries talking together, to find common ground, and in the case of the space station, to literally find higher ground, a higher purpose to say, okay, we don't agree on something, but let's all agree on one thing. Let's agree on the importance of science, the importance of exploration, the importance that ultimately we need to find a way to live and work together. And to me, that's what space cooperation, space diplomacy is about. Well, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you very much.